Thanks so much for staying. Welcome back. My government is reopening three new bonds to help raise fresh cash and reduce interest paid on them on some of these papers. The 7, 10 and 15 year bonds which are being sold through the book up building approach would be closed tomorrow. George Riafi explores the impact of this fund raising exercise on the rising public debts. Government is now planning to pay 17 to 18.15 percent on all these papers instead of the initial interest of 19 to 19.75 percent, which analysts describe as significant reduction or call it some savings on previous bonds sold. According to the Finance Ministry, it is hoping to use the strategy to restructure pension contributions of some public sector workers that were invested in short dated instruments and move it into long dated ones, taking into account long term maturity profile of pension liabilities and use these funds raised to finance some projects and initiatives in the budget. The move, according to analysts, is one of several strategies that has helped to slow the rate of increase of the public debt over the past four months to hit 139 billion Ghana cities in September this year. This offer also seeks to attract new investors from outside the country who could bring in some dollars to help stabilize the Ghana city. Because of the strategy being used for this bond sale, it is difficult for now to establish the amount of money being raised. Some industry analysts are, however, worried about government's borrowings from outside the country and how this could impact on the Ghana city, especially when the time is due for repayment. According to the 2018 budget, managers of the economy are planning to set aside almost 15 billion Ghana cities as interest on loans. And in a related development, government is open to issue a fresh five-year bond today, but is planning not to pay more than 17.75% on this pay. My government is advancing steps to institute a comprehensive policy for regulating small and medium-scale enterprises in the country, according to the team leader for industrial subcontract and partnership exchange at the Ministry of Trade and Industry, Papa Battels, the SME policy seeks to maximize the potential of SME sector in driving the country's economic growth. Here's Bismarck Awusa's report read to you. SMEs constitute about 90% of Ghana's economy, but research has revealed that many startups do not survive beyond the first year of operation due to several setbacks such as financing. The SME policy is therefore supposed to address such long-standing challenges to drive the country's economic growth agenda. Team leader for industrial, subcontracts and partnership exchange at the Ministry of Trade and Industry, Papa Batels, shed more light on it. We have um, a huge number of enterprises in this country um, involved in SMEs and if there is chaos in that front it will not augur well for the development of uh, enterprises that are small and medium. So looking at that, government is rolling out a, a policy for SMEs and that will look at all the issues that confront SME in the country. So how soon is this going to roll out? It, it's, it's, it's in its uh, formative um, stage. So, you know, the, the policy development process takes quite a bit of time. So you would have the um, initial process, you have consultation with key stakeholders, and then it has to go to uh, cabinet for cabinet to accent, then possibly goes to parliament, you know, so it, it will take a bit of time. He spoke to Joy Business on the sidelines of a stakeholder forum aimed at growing green businesses in the country. A green business is one that proactively adopts environmentally friendly practices to ensure efficient use of resources. The Green Business Forum was organized under the auspices of the Ghana Climate Innovation Center, GCIC, in collaboration with partners such as the UN University of Institute of Natural Resources in Africa. Executive Director of the GCIC, Ruka Sanusi, spoke to Joy Business about her outfit's critical role in growing the local green business economy. The Green Business um, Incubator, with a unique focus on supporting businesses in the green economy, 
um, but businesses are also in the small and growing business sector. So it's for um, businesses that are, have the potential um, to shape the economy, the green economy of Ghana in the, in the short to medium and, and also, in fact, the long term. The Green Business Forum was under the theme Green Businesses in Ghana, Opportunities for Growth. Still on the marketplace, now Ghanaian citizens are yet to enjoy the full benefits of the annual budget funding amounts from 2014 to 2016. That's according to an assessment by the Kumasi Institute of Technology and Environment, KITE, on oil-funded projects. The assessment was based on the four priority areas, which include education, health, agriculture, and infrastructure, and mandate, as mandated by the Petroleum Revenue Management Act, PRMA. Addressing a stakeholder workshop on key provisions of the Act, Executive Director of the KITE, Ishmael Ejikumihine, revealed that about 65% of projects in the beneficiary districts are not listed as priorities per the law. Ebenezer Sabuti is currently at a workshop uh, which is ongoing at the Coconut Group Hotel here in Accra and joins us live with some updates. Uh, Ebenezer, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Yima. All right, now, so how were these projects delivered and how come they were not part of the priority projects under the law? Well, according to KITE, that's the Kumase Institute of Technology and Environment, uh, they went around the cities and the communities that some of these projects were earmarked in the annual budgetary fund amount. So it's through their engagement with the community and the district assemblies that they came out that some of these projects were actually non-existent. Some of the priority areas which we all knew has to do with agriculture, health, education, were extended instead of four, some were even six and ten. So they could not be able to locate some of the projects. But, I mean, we are fortunate to have with us here Mr. Ishmael Ajokumini, who will explain more of what the findings were to us. Welcome to the market, please, Mr. Ajokumini. Thank you. Um, please tell us some of the highlights of the findings from your angle. Well, it's, we have realized that for most of the projects that the, we deem to have been funded with oil money, uh, we we only we only funded them partly, and because we funded them partly, some of the projects that we went looking for were either non-existent or they were projects that are, were reported to have been funded by other interventions. We also noted that uh, throughout the study that we have, as we had always suspected, we have used the money to fund too many things, and it was making the projects less impactful. So one may ask, what should be uh, the way forward? I mean, what's your suggestion? We need to stop spreading the money. We need to stop targeting too many projects. Let's focus on, even if it's one project, let's focus on that and use them. And otherwise, after another five years, we'll come back and we'll be in the same situation. Uh, would that be a fair conclusion to say the money were not spent uh, fairly? As, as expected by the Act, I wouldn't say we have been able to spend the money as expected by the Act because there are, there are four objectives that the Act said. If we use the ABFA money, we have to ensure, amongst other things, balance, even in balanced development, we should use it to maximize economic development, we use to uh, help the people who are disadvantaged. And if you look at those four areas and that it should be aligned to a long-term national development plan, you, I wouldn't say that we've been able to achieve that. But in all this, what has been your engagement with the Ministry of Finance to ensure that some of these monies have been accounted for? Well, the Ministry of Finance is uh, supposed to report to Parliament, and Parliament, in actual fact, are the ones who are supposed to get the Ministry of Finance to do the right things. Clearly, the way they, even the projects are, dis are described you cannot even go and find some of the project because of their description. So the Ministry of Finance, thankfully, they were here. So they know what they are supposed to do. They know they need to report on the project as dictated by the law so as to allow for easy monitoring of the projects. We are moving into 2018. The 2018 budget was read. I mean, with the allocation of ABFA, what would be your recommendation from KITE? to the minister or from the, to, the, to the government? Already those allocations have been made, um, but almost, almost of the time, even when they stick to the four areas, they end up selecting so many other sub-areas or sub-sectors. would encourage the minister 
to stick to those areas as defined and they should be mindful of the law that we shouldn't spend it over more than four areas. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Ishmele Jukumini. So you might, if you can hear me, that was Mr. Ishmele Jukumini, who is the executive director of the Kumase Institute of Technology and Environment, explaining some of their findings from the various districts and municipal assemblies with regards to the annual budgetary funding amount for Now, Ebenezer, be before you go, I don't know whether Ishmael is gone, but I really wanted to find out from him because earlier, uh, the, um, uh, what do you call ASEP also came out with a survey and pointed out some projects that have not been delivered under the ABFA. Are these the same projects he's talking about, or these are quite different uh, projects? He's gone, but I can partly answer this. I think uh, most of the projects that he mentioned were similar to what he said and uh, PIAC has gone to, I mean, inspect. And the story is the same. There hasn't been any much change. Myself, I was one of those uh, enterprises that went to the eastern region, and we could find so many of the projects that were not there. Others too were diverted. I, I could see the monies were diverted to do something else. All right. Uh, if there's nothing more, then I would like to thank you so much for your time and your attention. That was Beniza Sabuti reaching us live from the Coconut Group Hotel, uh, where today um, the Kumasi Institute of Technology and Environment, KITE, has been assessing the annual budget funding amount and uh, um, the petroleum receipts. And moving on on the market, please. The Association of Certified Chartered Economists, ACCE, has held its fifth continuous professional development CDP program and induction in Accra. In an interview on the sidelines of a seminar as part of the induction, Head of Finance School of Business at the University of Cape Coast, Dr. John Gachi, highlighted the conflict in the Petroleum Act and the Petroleum Revenue Management Act with regards to using petroleum reserves as collateral for funding upstream petroleum activities. In all, a total of 41 students were inducted, 39 as chartered members and two fellows of the Association of Chartered Certified Economists. They had earlier undergone series of examinations and taken part in continuous professional development programs to qualify. Among the topics discussed at the seminar that preceded the induction ceremony were emerging issues in public procurement and reserve based financing and also banking distress, causes and effects. Head of Finance School of Business at the University of Cape Coast, Dr. John Gachi, in an interview underscored the critical nature of securing financing for petroleum upstream activities and how banks are managing with reserve-based financing. He unearthed some conflict situations in the Petroleum Act and Petroleum Revenue Management Act with regards to using petroleum reserves as collateral to access funding. But what we have been emphasizing uh, is that uh, in the case of uh, reserve-based uh, lending, there is what we call reserve reports. Uh, it is the reserve report that will indicate uh, the various things that the financial institution is interested in. For example, the financial institution will want to see a reserve uh, report semi-annually uh, to indicate the due diligence uh, regarding leasehold for oil and gas operation and ownership right, uh, the, 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 the time value of money issues, uh, that is the discount factor, uh, looking at uh, uh, issues relating to the type and classification of reserve, because we have different type of reserve. Uh, basically, financial institutions are interested in proving reserve because they believe that the reserve production ratio uh, is about 90% sure that uh, petroleum uh, production can take place uh, in commercial uh, quantity. Uh, but the, the issue we have been raising is that if you look at Section 5, uh, Subsection 2 of the Petroleum Revenue Management Act, uh, it is very clear that petroleum reserve shall not be used for collateral. So which means that in a way we are being limited to use petroleum reserve as collateral. But again, when you go to Section 57 of the Petroleum Act, Act uh, 919, uh, it is very clear that petroleum agreement and licenses and permit cannot be used as uh, collateral for borrowing or for mortgaging. Uh, but there is an allowance in the Act that indicates that uh, when permission is sought from 
uh, the minister and is granted, then you can mortgage your petroleum agreement. On his part, lecturer at the Department of Marketing and Supply Chain Management, University of Cape Coast, Innocent Aqua, said the Public Procurement Act is only good if it will be strictly complied with. He advocated a commission to oversee its implementation. We are running away from sole sourcing. Even though sole sourcing is not a bad thing, the only thing we need to do is to ensure that it is regulated and it is implemented well. That is why our act captured sole sourcing as a method of procurement and also gave procedures we should follow if we want to do sole sourcing. So if any entity fails to follow those procedures, then the PPA should step in to ensure that those procedures are followed. If those members follow the procedures and the actors in the market still try to rig the system, as I mentioned, that then we need a competition and market commission. Essentially, their duty will be to investigate all actions of collusion in the market that tries to suppress competition. I would prefer it is in the form of shrad, as shrad is. However, it should be said that they can investigate or they can on their own start an investigation as well as receive complaints from individuals from the public mm -hmm. upon which they can then start investigation. When they do that, then we will ensure that the actors in the market who will try to rig the system are unable to do so. Chief Risk Officer at Premium Bank, Joseph Asante, spoke on causes and effects of banking distress in the sub-region. In an interview, he explained the relevance of protecting customers' deposits through insurance. It seeks to protect the deposits of depositors generally. And what we are saying is that customers put their money in banks and they expect that these banks would use their monies creditably. Now, should there be any cause for a bank's failure, the deposits that are stored with these banks, that have been used by these banks, should be repayable. Customers should get their money. And so the insurance part of it is, is, is meant towards ensuring that when banks insure the deposits of these customers, should there be liquidity issues, should there be crisis, should there be crisis, these monies would return we returned to, to these customers. And it is important that we have that. We have that in the wake of the ki kind of uh, lapses that have been shown within the last few years, where we have seen non-bank financial institutions, we have seen uh, some banks collapse, etc. You are concerned that, well, customers kept their money there. They kept their money. So when those banks collapse, where would their monies be? Thankfully, GCB for instance, is taking over those banks, so those deposits are still safe. And the Association of Certified Chartered Economists recognizes the fact that certifications and designations are competitive differentiators and one of the best ways to prove employees have the necessary knowledge, skills and experience to perform their jobs. Now, Air Mauritius, Ethiopian Airlines and indigenous carrier Africa World Air have been named by Aviation Minister Sisi Adapa as airlines that are currently being examined for the establishment of a national carrier. This follows recent policy approval by Parliament for the Ministry to commence work on the establishment of a home carrier since the demise of Ghana Airways in 2204. Speaking to Joy Business at the launch of the Aviation Safety Week, the Sector Minister Sisi Adapa said her ministry is seriously assessing proposals to find a most suitable partner for government. So we've been working to bring on board a number of uh, um, projects, including the establishment of both local uh, or domestic, regional, as well as international airlines. And we are vigorously pursuing that. You heard of uh, baby jets? Yes, they are ongoing. We are not even one year yet in government. But look at the strides. We have a lot of unsolicited as well as solicited uh, proposals that uh, we are studying. So very soon, when the green light, you know, we have the policy approval from cabinet. So we are on course. We are reviewing all the proposals. Yes. Yeah. The interests have been shown by Air Mauritius and Ethiopian Airlines, as well as our. So we are doing the permutations and studying the proposals to see which one will suit Ghana's private participation, as well as government interest. Now, when she failed to raise money to further her education after senior high school, Sandra Oswald was not deterred. In the midst of challenges, she discovered an opportunity in making shoes. 
uh, of course, men's shoes. Now, today, her shoe brand, St. Oswald, is grabbing attention. Sandra invites us to the capital of the Bonahafu region, Sunyai, where the shoes are manufactured on this episode of the Joy Business Van. Here's what to expect. Sandra Oswald has had to deal with one challenge or the other growing up. After senior high school, she was at a crossroads. That time my parents had nothing to help me continue my education. So I have to have it for myself, do something for myself. And I'm a type who don't like to depend on people. And also, I love to create something on my own. But back at the senior high, I used to even make granite cakes ice cream and sell them secretly to my friends. So after school, when I realized there was no money to support my education again, I decided to do something for myself. It was at a friend's wedding it occurred to Sandra she could make shoes. I realized the husband, which was a groom, was wearing a shoe which was made with African print. And I was quite shocked because I never knew we could make shoes in Ghana. So after the wedding, I contacted the bride, who, who is my friend, contacted her and I asked her about the shoe her husband was wearing and she told me, oh, it's made in Ghana. And I said, wow. Fascinated by that, Sandra made keen arrangements to meet the shoemaker whose products she would start selling. But after a while, Sandra did not want to just be a shoe seller. She wanted to own a shoe manufacturing company. She convinced her shoemaker friend to join her and that is how St. Oswald Shoes started. So for Sandra Oswald's full story, make a date tonight on the Business Live. My name is Emmanuel Abouaji. We are Fidacit for Marketplace. Good afternoon.